To start out on the history of Korea, um, the, the ancient history of Korea goes back 400,000 years according to archaeological evidence. We have evidence of um, tool making that goes back, again, um, more than 40 millennia. And then in 8000 BC, we have the first examples archaeologically found of Korean pottery. Uh, pottery is, um, you may or may not realize it, is always one of the most significant uh, evidences of the development of civilization because it means that the people were uh, making uh, crafts for themselves, useful products. They were usually stable in one place in order to be able to create these things. So pottery, shards of pottery, uh, various broken pieces around the world often are a primary symbol of civilization. And we have them from 8000 BC here uh, in, well, where we're going, in Korea. Around 4000 BC, we have evidence of settled farming. And um, around 1500 BC, we have evidence of a sort of socio-political organization. We begin to see larger uh, residences for leaders and for priests, that sort of thing. There's all sorts of uh, particular kinds of evidence. By about 1000 BC, we have bronze articles that are created. By about 300 BC, we've gone into the Iron Age and we have various iron weapons and tools made. And about that same time, around 300 BC, the Korean people begin to move from just being tribes to becoming small kingdoms. Now the most important date, which is reflected up here, in terms of Korean history, is very important because it also reflects something about the culture and uh, kind of the ethos of the Korean people. According to Korean tradition, in 2333, notice how specific that is, uh, BC, the nation of Korea was created in the form of a kingdom called Gojoseon, which you can see right here, Gojoseon. Originally, it was all of the Korean Peninsula. Then traditionally, this was created, this kingdom was created by a uh, sort of a divine being, Dangun, he was called, who was the son of heaven, who came down from heaven and created this kingdom. Even though we have no archeological evidence or written evidence of that, obviously this is over 4,000 years ago, the, uh, the people of Korea are very <laughs> insistent that they have existed as a kingdom and as a people since 2333 BC. And much of the pride they feel as a people is based upon that tradition. Again, there's no evidence for that. But don't try to make an argument about that to someone who is, you know, a proud Korean, because this is very important to them. Um, the first mention of Gojoseon as a kingdom, it really was a kingdom, the issue is when it was founded, but uh, we go all the way back, back to the 7th century BC um, in order to be able to uh, find evidence in the Chinese writings of this. You know, I'm going to have to have, uh, could somebody who knows where the office is, go and knock on the door and ask Christy if she could come and turn down the volume, because I'm going to keep having problems with this. Do you know where the office is there? It's the, um, or Richard? Yeah, one of, one of, if one of y'all could go and do that, because I'm going to have trouble with this thing as I, as I keep going along. So we have evidence uh, in writing from the 7th century, and then by the 4th century um, uh, BC, we clearly there are records in China of the Gojoseon uh, kingdom being in relationship with China, we then have um, all the way down to 108 BC, which is considered the end of this sort of prehistoric period. Anthony, could you turn the volume down in there for me? Very kind. Uh, testing, testing, a little bit more than that, I think. Um, are we good? No, we got nothing now. A little bit more, a little bit more. A little bit higher now, a little bit higher now, yeah, a little bit, okay, I think that's perfect, is that right? That's great. I work for you, good. Thank you, Anthony. Sorry about that, well, I should have tested it when somebody was in here to help with that. Um, so, 108 BC, which is considered the end of ancient Korea, was when Han China invaded, the Han Dynasty of China invaded Korea, and they set up four what they call commanderies, which were sort of like centers of operation. Eventually, three of those um, fell away and got merged and back and forth splitting up until finally we come to one of the very important parts of Korean history, which is called the Three Kingdoms era. There's actually more than one period that they call Three Kingdoms, but this is the primary one. The Three Kingdoms, um, Goguryeo, 
Gogoryeo later on becomes Goryeo, and that's where we get the name Korea, um, is an adaptation of that. Silla and Baikje. Baikje eventually is conquered by Silla, and then Silla conquers uh, Gogoryeo, and so we end up by the 600s AD of having one kingdom that is controlling all of the, the peninsula here in Korea. And obviously you know that Korea is a peninsula that connects uh, along the, the Yalu River, as it's called today, um, that's the border between Korea and China. And so the Yalu River comes into it to a great extent whenever you start talking about migrations or battles, wars between um, various people. We'll talk about that some in the discussion on the Korean War as well. So by 668, the Silla has taken over all of the other two kingdoms and all of the Korean Peninsula. Now, there was one monarch at that time, but Silla was still very much a tribal kind of society. And they had a council of tribal leaders from the various elements that were within the kingdom of Silla called the Quebec. The Quebec was a council of leaders. Later on, they became a council of nobles. And they actually chose the monarchs. They chose who was going to be king over this kingdom. They held absolute control as a council of nobles. Uh, at that time, it was a strictly hierarchical society. Uh, most of the people, obviously, were serfs. And then when you got to the nobles, there were uh, various levels, hierarchical levels of nobles. And the highest ones were the ones that represented the, um, the, their tribe on the Quebec Council, and they chose the kings. Um, they followed, at this time, a Chinese example. Already, China is beginning to strongly influence uh, the events and the government and, and the culture to some extent in Korea. And so they create a Confucian university based upon Confucianism as, as it has developed in China. This Confucian university offered uh, classes only to noble people. You had to be a noble in order to be able to take these classes and you had to take these classes in order to be able to take well, what amounted to the civil service exam to get a position in the government. So nobles could be educated in Confucian law and then could take a test, and this was the same that they had developed in China and existed in China for, you know, 1,500 years uh, during the Chinese dynasties. But in the 4th century, again from China, there was the introduction, 4th century AD now, the introduction of Buddhism into Korea and many temples were built. Throughout the history of Korea, there have been three um, major religious traditions that at various times one or the other of them have taken preeminence. They are Korean shamanism, the original religion, the native religion of Korea, which is comparable to Shinto in Japan. It is the original folk religion. Korean shamanism still exists today. After that, Confucianism came in from, uh, and then later a, a Neo-Confucianism from China, and Buddhism. So those three, Korean shamanism, uh, Korean version of a Neo-Confucianism, and Buddhism, all three still exist today, but all three have been fundamental in the development of the culture and the beliefs of the people of Korea. So in the 4th century AD, Buddhism comes in. Um, by the late 8th century AD, the Silla kingdom is beginning to fall apart, and various warlords in, around the French is especially are beginning to break away. Um, in 918, a warlord named Guan Jiang forms a new um, state, which he calls Goryeo. Goryeo becomes Korea later on. It's a shortening of the Gogorya, um, the, the first of the uh, kingdoms. And in 1935, he becomes the ruler, and Goryeo is the kingdom for all of the Korean peninsula. That takes us into what's called the unitary dynasty. You just said 1935. Is it 935? I'm sorry, 935. 1935? That was a little bit late. But no, 935. Okay. Um, the unitary dynasty period, which started in 918 and then 935, um, this particular warlord united everyone. And this lasted all the way into the 1900s in one form or another. Now, various other people came into it. 1910, which is listed here, is the start of the colonial period which involved the Japanese. We'll get to that in just a minute. 
During this period of time, the uh, Goryeo kingdom, the Chinese tried to, involve, uh, to invade several times, particularly the Manchurians, or Yurkins, as they were called back then, because Manchuria is the state of China that's immediately beyond the Yellow River, and so therefore closest to Korea. They tried on several instances to evade, invade, um, and then in 1231, the Mongols, who had taken over, you remember, if you were at one of the earlier lectures, um, the Mongols had taken over China in the 1200s. 1231, they invaded Korea. Now, the royal family of Korea um, hightailed it. They were hiding on an island and were not, uh, were not able to be captured, but the Mongols sort of rampaged up and down the Korean peninsula, but the Koreans are a tough lot. They never did completely give in. The Mongols were never able to completely suppress them and control them. Eventually, the royal family came back after about 40 years in hidden exile, and the Mongols accepted them as puppet rulers. And so they were puppet rulers throughout the Yuan Empire of China. Um, in the 13th century, Neo-Confucianism, a new version of Confucianism, came over from China, and it, it was much stricter. It was much more rigid. Um, I'm going to talk about the religions of, of Japan later, and I'll bring in a little bit Confucianism. Uh, the Confucianism is almost more a philosophy for society than it is a religion. I mean, it, there there is the worship of certain deities now, but originally uh, Lao Tzu or Lao Tzu, depending upon you know um, how who you're reading, the originator of Confucianism. He, um, the, or, I'm sorry, Confucius. Lao Tzu was Taoism, but Confucius, who founded Confucianism, this all runs together up here. Um, he, his primary concern is setting up a system that people, if they followed it, they would have a stable and productive society. And so there was a very strong emphasis on recognizing your place in society and your responsibilities to your family, to your master, to your country, and then fulfilling those responsibilities. It did not leave a lot of leeway for personal ambition or for any, any other variations. And so when Neo-Confucianism came over into Korea in the 13th century, it created a kind of rigidity that made it very difficult for Korea later on to break out of that. Um, and it had certain advantages in terms of creating stability, but disadvantages in that didn't give them a whole lot of options as to where to go creatively as a people. Um, in 1392, a general of Korea was ordered, his name was Yi Song uh, Ji, Yi Song Ji was ordered by his rulers in Korea to attack the Ming Empire, which he did not think was a very good idea because the Ming Empire was very powerful. They're the ones that built all of that great wall that you, you all saw when you were in Beijing. And so instead, he turned around and attacked his own rulers, defeated them, and ended up becoming the king in 1394. Now, this Confucianism, around that same time, becomes the official state religion. Buddhism is not outlawed, but it's pushed to the fringes. Um, it's ordered out of the cities. The Buddhist temples are only allowed to be out in the countryside. And so Confucianism, Neo-Confucianism, really takes a strong uh, effect. In 1443, the Koreans develop their own <laughs> alphabet. Prior to that, we were discussing this uh, right before the talk, prior to that, the Koreans had used the Chinese alphabet, but there was a very strong motive uh, on their part to be independent, to have their own alphabet, their own language. They adapted a lot of Chinese, as did the Japanese. As we were saying in, J um, in Japan, the Japanese directly carry over certain characters, and, and they pronounce them differently than Japanese characters, but they use both. Um, not nearly as many Chinese characters, but they use Chinese characters in the Japanese language as well. Well, the Koreans had done the same thing, except they didn't really develop their own independent alphabet until the mid-1400s. Um, in 1592, and that's what's reflected in this map over here, we have what's called the Imjin War. In 1592, the Japanese um, land on the southern tip you know, as you can see, Japan's not far away there. They land on the southern tip at Busan, and they invade the country. They are very successful at the land war, the Japanese against the Koreans, but the Koreans have a very good admiral who defeats the Japanese at sea, and so after two years, the Japanese are forced to withdraw. 
1597, they try again, and the same thing happens, and after a year, they have to withdraw. The engine war is very interesting, though, because it was a point at which there was a lot of crossover between culture and particularly the arts of Korea and of Japan. Those of you who were uh, same group I was with today, bus number three, when we were in the castle and we were looking at some of the ceramics, our guide mentioned the fact that the ceramics there were heavily influenced by Korea. The Koreans were far more developed in their ceramic industry at that time. They had developed celadon, which is the sort of green glaze, sometimes crackled green glaze. They had also developed a white kind of glaze. And when the engine war happened in the late 1500s, the Japanese rounded up several thousand of the best potters in Korea and forced them to go back with them to Japan. And so Japanese pottery was heavily influenced by the artistry that had been developed in Korea. And it was wonderful, fascinating, in fact, to hear the Japanese guy today readily say, yeah, the, the best of our ceramics are really influenced by Korea, because that's what happened at that point. Uh, so Korea was really van at the vanguard in terms of creativity and artistry and ceramics and other things at that point. Um, it was, just to tie this into previous talks I've done, the end of the 1500s, the start of the 1600s, in fact, during the engine war, uh, one of the, the, the shogun was killed. The shogun of Japan was killed. They had had a shogun, a military ruler, since the late 1100s. But during the engine war, or right at that time, the shogun was killed and a new shogunate came in, you know, the Tokugawa shogunate. And they took over in 1606, right after the engine war, and shortly after that, the Tokugawa shogunate uh, in, in installed the policy of what's called uh, Sokuru, which is isolationism. And so it was between that early 1600s and all the way up to the middle 1500s, 1853, when the American gunboats under uh, Commodore uh, Matthew Perry came into Edo Harbor, Tokyo Harbor, that they, um, they were completely shut off, the Japanese. And it was as a direct result, part of it was the frustration that they felt over not being successful in trying to invade twice in the 1590s, trying to invade Korea, because Korea proved to be a very difficult enemy. Um, at the same time, um, later on in the 18th century and early 19th century, they began to have foreigners coming, that is Westerners, Europeans, coming to Korea. And when the Europeans started coming to Korea, I, I, this picture, you can see that there are Europeans in here, there and down here. But mostly I have this picture because those are cool hats. <laughs> I, I want to get one of those hats yeah. somewhere when we're in Korea. Okay, very cool hats. But as the Europeans started to come to Korea, um, many Koreans didn't want to trade with them because like Japan and like China at various times, they really felt that the, the Westerners were a bad influence. They really weren't sure about them. So a lot of the Koreans didn't want to trade with them, and Korea attempted to have, like China did for a while and Japan did for, you know, for 200 years, uh, over 200 years, they wanted a period of isolationism. At several times during the 19th century, uh, various Western powers came to try to, uh, well, like two French priests were killed in 1866. The French wanted to take retribution for this, so they sent gunboats to Korea to try to, you know, show their strength, and the Koreans beat them. They drove off the French gunboats. Same thing happened later with the U.S. The United States sent gunboats there, and whereas the Shogun in Japan was very impressed with these gunboats, the Koreans beat them off. You know, they didn't, they were not successful in even landing, and so the Koreans were more successful in preventing military intervention by the West than the Japanese had been during that same period of time. But the Japanese continue to have an interest in Japan. As we said, after 1853, and then especially the Meiji Restoration in Japan in um, 1866, it started, Japan really needed the oil and the steel, or iron to make steel, and coal that was in Korea, because they don't have any of those things in Japan, and Japan was trying to industrialize. They were trying to become a manufacturing nation. They were trying to especially build up their military. Very hard to make cannons if you can't make steel. And so they uh, began to be more and more present 
in Japan. And this came to a point where there began to be conflicts between the Chinese who were influencing Korea very heavily and the Japanese who wanted to influence very heavily. Finally, in the 1870s, 1875 and 76, Japan forced Korea to um, declare that they were not tied only to China, that they were open to other trade, especially that they were open to trade with Japan. This is 1875 and 76. And then in 1880, the king of Korea, who was King Gojong, he decides you know, we've gotten behind the times with our isolationist attitude, and so we need to do a lot more interacting with the West, who have got cannons and gunboats and, you know, uh, firearms that are better than ours. And so the king of, of Korea at this point, after being forced to be open to other influences by the Japanese, he starts a reform policy, and his slogan is, Eastern Ethics, Western Technology. Now. During this period of time of the 1880s, Korea signs trade agreements with uh, the USA, with Britain, Germany, Russia, and France, in addition to Japan. So they're really opening this, themselves up to a lot of this kind of influence, which Japan is not really happy about because Japan wanted to have a monopoly on the resources that they could get out of Korea. And so this creates a, a considerable difficulty between the Koreans and the Japanese. In the 1880s, again, same period of time, but just a few years later, Japan and Korea both have um, legations, that is, official representatives in Korea. Both of them are trying to influence Korea to side with them. And there actually was a split in the political leaders in Korea. Some of them thought they should stay with China. Some of them thought they should move their allegiance to Japan and that that would be better for them. And there continue to be disputes, not only between the Chinese and the Japanese in Korea, but between various parties of the Koreans in Korea who sided with one or the other, China or Japan. There were various flare-ups at various times. Uh, for instance, in 1882, there's the Emo Rebellion. This has nothing to do with the puppet. It's the IMO, Emo Rebellion, in which there was a um, Koreans who sided with China actually burned the Japanese legation in Seoul. They um, killed one military advisor and the other officials from Japan were forced to flee in a small fishing boat and got picked up later. Well, they came back around on that one and they forced Korea to pay compensation for it. They signed the Treaty of Jamolpo, which increased the level of Japanese influence in Korea and had them stationing Japanese troops. Well, the Japanese and the Chinese kept, kept having flare-ups. You know, they they're both had troops there, and they were fighting with each other until finally they said, we've got to stop this. And they signed a treaty called the Treaty of Lee Ito, in which the Chinese and the Japanese both said, we'll remove our troops from Korea, and we will not send troops back unless we let the other party know, that is, the Chinese let the Japanese know, or vice versa. And so that way, we're not going to have these conflicts. Well, unfortunately, for everybody involved, I think, there was a rebellion called the Dong Hak Rebellion, which was a panentheistic religion in, um, and if you don't know what panentheism is, then I'll have to do a world's religion talk for you. They, the Dong Hak Rebellion in Korea really scared the king of, of Korea. And so, more out of habit than anything else, he called on the Chinese and said, help us with this rebellion. So the Chinese sent in troops. Well, Japan hears about this and they said, wait a minute, we have a treaty that says you don't send in troops unless you ask us first. So they sent in troops. The Japanese troops and the Chinese troops come into conflict with one another, and this is the beginning of the first Sino-Japanese War, the first war between uh, China and Japan. Now, as I mentioned in my earlier lecture about the China versus Japan, the first lecture I did, nobody thought that Japan had a chance against the giant power in the East, which was uh, China. They had a much larger army in China, but whereas China had been trying under the Qing Dynasty to modernize, to modernize their army, to develop their military, they had not been successful in that. Whereas the Japanese, after the Meiji Restoration in 1866 to 68, they had 30 years in which they had aggressively 
communicated with the West, had military advisors come in, were taught, they, were, they bought uh, battleships from France, they had major weaponry that it had brought in, and so in six months, to everyone's surprise, other than maybe the Japanese, the Japanese defeated China in the first Sino-Japanese War. As a result of that, Japan took over uh, principal control of Korea informally. They became a, Korea became a tribute state, meaning they were supposed to uh, be obedient and pay tribute and that sort of thing to Japan. But that began to change fairly quickly. Japan appointed a regent for Korea. They appointed a council to sort of run the government, and then they started instituting reforms in Korea. At first, they sounded like pretty good ideas. For instance, the Japanese forced the Koreans to outlaw slavery. They forced the, the Koreans to agree that widowed women could remarry, which they had not been able to before in, in Korea, and that there would no longer be any children marriages. They used to marry children off, uh, and particularly child brides, you know. Um, so they got rid of all that, and all that sounded good. But then not too long after that, it became clear that Japan had a desire to radically change, if not obliterate, Korean culture and make it part of Japan. They closed the newspapers, they, re they um, stopped the study of Korean culture in schools and replaced it with the study of Japanese culture. They abolished Confucian thought, which was fundamental to the way Korea was working at that point. They took land away from Korean farmers and gave it to Japanese settlers. They, they invited Japanese businesses to come to Korea, and then they outlawed the Korean businesses that were in conflict or in competition with them. So clearly there was an orientation toward Japanese and against historical Korea. Um, and then the army was disbanded. Finally, they stopped all pretense, and in 1910, the Japanese annexed Korea and officially said, you're now part of our country. As they continued during this colonial period, which from 1910 to 1945 is called the colonial period, and of course, 45 is when the Japanese were defeated in the Second World War, and they lost their, their power, but during that period of time, Korea was entirely seen by the Japanese as a source of labor and food and raw materials for Japan and for their expansionist desires. Um, the Koreans were producing food, and yet they, for the most part, didn't have enough because it was all being taken away from them and taken to taken Japan. Um, people were in forced labor. In 1919, the, after nine years of this, there were protests all over Korea against the colonial rule of the Japanese. The Japanese military came in, thousands of people were arrested and executed. You know, they were absolutely ruthless in putting down this protest. Between 1919 and 1925, as a result of that, the Korean communists, who, were, who had been inspired by, as, as the Chinese were, been inspired by the Russian Revolution just a few years before that, um, they began to organize as communists with this new, new idea that we're doing this for the sake of the people, and they began to fight back uh, in guerrilla warfare against the Japanese. They then established in 1919 a provisional government for Korea in nationalist China. So they had a, a government in exile, which was not official, it was not accepted, and then in 1938, um, as, as they were getting closer and closer to what we in the West think of the Second World War, but they were already at war in China, the Japanese outlawed the Korean language. They went so far as to say Koreans were not allowed to speak um, Korean. They were forcing people to take Japanese names. They were forcing people, since they'd gotten rid of Confucianism, they were forcing people to accept the Shinto faith. So they were doing everything in their power during this colonial period, the Japanese, to force the Koreans to become Japanese. And the Koreans weren't having it. There was constant pushback. There was constant guerrilla warfare. There was a complete unwillingness because the Koreans have always been very, very proud of their history and culture. As I say, they have a strong tradition that, their, that Korea started in 2333 BC when a divine being came from heaven and created the, the Gojoseon, which was the original Korean uh, nation. So they were not going to give in despite all of the efforts of the Japanese military to force them to.
should have brought this up earlier. This is the Japanese rule under Imperial China. These are some of the rebels that were prepared to fight against them as the Japanese entered in full military capability. So uh, by 1938 to 1940, Korea is entirely under Japanese rule and they can't get any help from China because uh, Manchuria, which got annexed also by the Japanese and they renamed it as a puppet regime, Manchukuo, um, there was nothing the Chinese could do for them. And so they were on their own in that regard. I wanna take a sidestep now and talk about Korean culture. Because even though Korea has spent centuries being batted back and forth between China and Japan, they still have maintained a very um, clear, distinct culture. They are very proud of their history and of their culture. They have never been willing to give that up. And so these are all just various images I found. Um, the Korean culture is full of bright colors, full of um, the exuberant dance, they have some quiet dances too, of a lot of drum playing. Um, there is, you know, there are the religious traditions, and again, still today, we have both Korean shamanism and Confucianism and Buddhism still being practiced. And in many cases, and we'll talk about this under Japanese religions, those things get merged. Um, in Japan, they have a principle called Shinbutsu Shugu, which means the combination of um, uh, Buddhism and other religions, particularly uh, Shinto. So the same thing is true in terms of the people of Korea. There's a lot of interaction between those religions. They all still exist. But you can see that the color that they use is quite extraordinary in terms of their decorations, their musical instruments, their clothing. Um, Korea is a, a land of um, big tastes as well. Uh, how many people like kimchi? How many people have ever eaten kimchi? Kimchi is pickled vegetables. And traditionally what they do is they take cabbage and other vegetables and they bury, they put it in a pot, seal it and bury it and leave it for a period of time. The longer you leave it, the more fermented it gets. And it can be very strong. When I was in seminary in California back in the, this was in the 80s, uh, early 80s, then there were a lot of Korean students there. And they were cleaner probably than I was, but there was always the taint of kimchi around them because you eat enough of that and it begins to come out of your pores, right? And yet it's, it's tasty, some frequently it's hot. The Koreans even have what they call the five powerful flavors, which are garlic, leeks, um, a, a sort of wild sand leek, um, uh, onion, and what am I forgetting here, ginger. All strong flavors and they combine them because, you know, the Koreans are very big in terms of how they do things. So um, the Korean culture is, and, and the reason I mention the religions is because it is foundationally based upon some of their religious beliefs. Their culture really is tied to uh, originally Korean shamanism, but also Confucianism and Buddhism as well. And so you're gonna have a chance to experience that a little bit in Jeju. Um, and I'm gonna give you the island of Jeju, or Jeju as it used to be, has um, a very particular modern history related to the end of the Korean War, and I'll mention that in a few minutes, but you'll have a chance to experience some of these things when you get there. It is very traditional, as you probably know by now. You do not wear your shoes in a Korean home. You take them off. So make sure you wear your good socks if you're gonna be going any place and visiting homes or anything else in, in Korea, all right? In 1945, the Japanese were defeated in the Second World War, and so therefore, there was a sense in which, what are we gonna do with these areas that have been completely controlled by the Japanese in order to help them get back on their feet? At the Yalta Conference in November of 1943, Joseph Stalin, one of the allies at this point, after Hitler had betrayed him, um, Stalin agreed that he would join the allies in the war against Japan within three months of the allies winning the war in Europe. So on August 8th of 1945, this is two days after the dropping of the bomb on Hiroshima and one day before the dropping of the bomb on Nagasaki, I'm gonna be talking about that as well, um, USSR declares war on Korea, much to, or uh, Korea, declares war on Japan. And they immediately invade with their troops into Manchuria. Now this was a great disappointment to Japan because they had been trying to appeal to Stalin 
to come in on their side, not to battle, but in order to be able to get a better peace agreement than what they were afraid they were going to get from the Allies. But um, so the USSR invades through Manchuria. By the 10th of August, they are well down, after just two or three days, well down into the Korean Peninsula. When they had met at the Yalta Conference, they had discussed what are we going to do at the end of the war, USSR was going to come in on the Allies' side. They agreed that Korea was going to have to be a special case because Korea had been so thoroughly um, devastated by the Japanese, what are we going to do about this? And they had agreed that the USSR and the USA would have sort of uh, joint custodianship of Korea until they could get them on their feet, at which point it was agreed at the Yalta Conference that they would withdraw and that they would encourage an independent election for Korea to reestablish its own independence and its own nationality after being under the colonial rule of Japan for 35 years. So the Russians got the jump and they are well into Korea. The, at that point, two U.S. colonels, one of whom was Dean Rusk, who later on was the Secretary of State under, um, under Kennedy and Johnson, and another U.S. colonel named Charles Bonesteel, they were asked to find the best line at which that they could draw across Korea in order to sort of divide this custodianship between the USSR in the north and the USA in the south, and they came up with the 38th parallel. I don't know why they didn't say the 39th parallel, because that had been the dividing point in a previous war, but they said the 38th parallel. So they contacted Stalin, and kind of to their surprise, Stalin agreed that they would stop the 38th parallel, and they did. They kept their word. The Soviet troops who got there first stopped at the 38th parallel, north of Seoul. The U.S. landed troops in September in Korea, and they moved as quickly as they could up the 38th parallel. Now, at this point, U.S. and USSR were partners. They were allies. But 1945, late 1945, is the start of the Cold War because the other allies began to see what Russia was doing in Europe. That the parts of Eastern Europe they had taken over, they were, they were beginning to really uh, oppress them and lock it down. This was the time period in which uh, Churchill, giving a speech in the United States, uh, said an Iron Curtain has fallen across uh, Europe. And that's the first reference to Iron Curtain that we later on think about the Soviet control of Eastern Europe. Well, the U.S. troops land, they move up, U.S. and USSR start trying to negotiate how can we have elections. Well, we now know that Joseph Stalin had no intention, you know, his desire was to create a communist regime that was worldwide. And so he had no desire to have free elections. And so in the northern part of Korea, they began identifying the people that they could have in charge. They picked several candidates who did not go along with the Russian idea of how things were going to be done, and they disappeared. Um, when they said no to Stalin, somebody picked them outside their house the next day, and nobody ever heard from them again. That happened with several of them. They finally landed on a Korean who had been in the Soviet military. He had been a captain in the Soviet military named... Uh, no, that's Vietnam. Kim Il-sung, right. Just make sure you're awake. Um, Kim Il-sung, and he is put in place. He's a young captain, you know, not a, not a significant player, but he's somebody that they could control. So they put him in place after almost two years of trying to negotiate between the U.S. and the USSR as to how to have give Korea back its independence, the U.S., hands the, the problem over to the UN, and the UN proposes that there be free elections. The Soviet Union says no, because they don't think that uh, the South is ready for it. The fact is, in the North, because the Russians were so tightly controlling it, they were not having many problems with this custodianship idea. In the South, where we were encouraging freedom, they had a huge problem with it. The, South, the people, Koreans in the South were saying, we've been our own country since 2,333 BC. We don't need you to tell us how to have a country. And there were riots all over the South part of Korea. Not in the North, because the Russians didn't allow that. But in the South, and one of the places they had a huge problem was Jeju Island, where we're going tomorrow. In fact, 
there was such an uprising there against this idea of trusteeship or custodial control, uh, even though it was only to be for as short a period of time as possible, that they had a massive uprising on Jeju Island and 30,000 people ended up being killed by, by South Korean troops. The Allies finally stopped all that, but it was a huge problem. Not just there, but elsewhere. But it's an interesting part of their history on Jeju Island. Well, eventually, in 1948, the USSR establishes a communist government with Kim Il-sung at the head of it in North Korea. The US follows immediately with elections in the South and Syngman Rhee is elected president. Um, they establish a, a, a government body and they, well, they actually select Syngman Rhee uh, from an elected body. And then, 1949, both Soviets and the U.S. leave Korea. The next year, the next year, to, to everyone's surprise, surprise attack on June 25th of 1950, the North Korean military invades along the whole width of the 38th parallel, invades the South, under the claim that they are going to reunify their country. Joseph Stalin had approved that. Kim Il-sung was still very much under control of Stalin. He asked Stalin for permission to invade the South. Stalin was reluctant at first, finally agreed. But Stalin said, if you get in trouble, don't ask us for help. Don't ask the Soviet Union for help, because Stalin did not want to get involved in a war with the US. And he knew that could potentially be the result. He said, if you get in trouble, you need to ask Mao. In 1949, Mao Zedong had taken over China as the Communist Party, and they were closely linked with, with the Soviet Union, but he said, you get in a problem, you have to ask the Chinese. Well, when they attacked from the North into, the North Koreans attacked along the whole 38th parallel, and they pushed the South Korean army and a, the few American troops who were there at that time, um, down into the very corner, the South, east corner around Pusan, which we now know as Busan. Um, they conquered, they just crushed the South Korean army. Well, UN called for their member nations to all contribute troops to stop this invasion. And 16 countries contributed troops, but because Truman, the President of the United States, had clearly declared that he was dedicated to containing communist expansion, he sent significant number of troops. It was a, officially a UN armed force that was fighting in Korea, but 88% of them were Americans. So we were 88% of the military from the United States. They appoint Douglas MacArthur, General MacArthur, who had been the um, senior commander of the Allied Powers in China, uh, Vice Star General, and he comes in, he takes over, oh, not what I meant to do, he, know where we're going, um, and they land in Incheon. Now again, the troops, the, the Allied troops are down here, forced in the corner, but they land up here in Incheon, near Seoul. They cut off the armies of North Korea that are south of that. 125,000 North Korean soldiers are taken captive. They start pushing back, and they push the Allied, the, the United Nations forces at that point, push all the way back up almost to the Yalu River. You know, they take over almost all of North Korea. In fact, they, they landed in September 15th. Um, in November, MacArthur announces to the Americans, American public, um, your troops will all be home by Christmas. No problem. We got this one. But then, just as they're getting close to the Yellow River, 180,000 Red Army soldiers from China cross the Yellow River. Um, not expected. They push all of the UN, especially American troops, down south of Seoul. A counteroffensive allows them to push back, and they end up right back where they started, the 38th parallel, with the North Koreans and Chinese on the north side of the 38th parallel, and the UN, primarily American and, and uh, South Korean troops, on the south side. I'm going to talk about that much more tomorrow night. We'll give you more detail. So that's all you hear for now. Um, so where does that take us? The country of South Korea since 1945, the early administrations in South Korea under Syngman Rhee and others were not particularly democratic. Syngman Rhee 
that they had a lot of faith in before the, the Korean War in 1949, he had um, established security laws that allowed him to arrest critics and close newspapers. He, there were protests um, against him. There was a lot of government uh, corruption so that by 1960, after the Korean War, the economy was just in the shambles because of corruption. At that point, in 1960, there were student riots that forced Syngman Rhee to resign, and a general in 1961 named General Park Chung Hae, uh, by coup, launched a coup and took over the government. Interestingly, he was the father of the female president of South Korea that's now in jail. I'll get to that. Um, so he at first declared martial law, and then he allowed elections in 1961, and he was elected. He allowed elections again in 1967, and he was elected, and again in 71. But in 71, he just barely squeaked by. So when he got in office after the 71 election, he changed the Constitution to give himself more power, and he was assassinated. Well, after he was assassinated in October of, of 79, um, and despite the oppressive rule, Korea had been doing very, South Korea had been doing very well financially. They had begun to grow and grow and grow. And as they got further into the 80s and 90s, it was considered an economic miracle. They became a very productive, very, um, what had been a very undeveloped country had developed very much. Expanded education, roads, bridges, all kinds of things. 1979, there was again, after the assassination of uh, Park Chung-hee, there was another general that took over by coup. He ruled for a while, and then in the 1980s, because of further protests, he stepped down. And the, the government stabilized between the 1990s and today, but most recently, the past president, who is a woman, who was the daughter of the first military dictator who took over by coup, she was elected, there was great hope, and then it turned out there was a lot of selling of uh, privileges and of influence. She was arrested, she has been found guilty, they're waiting right now, uh, she's still in jail, they're waiting to see the penalty against her. But, for the most part, South Korea has been uh, an astonishing success story in terms of economics. Um, they have 50 million people now in South Korea. North Korea, very different story. Um, you all know Blockhead here. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, it's kind of hard to be too serious about that. Kim Il-sung, who the Russians had put in place, established a cult of personality, statues and portraits of himself everywhere. He was considered the great leader. School children were taught to look to him as the font of all wisdom. Um, and he continued to rule until 1994. When he died, or before he died, he anointed his son, Kim Jong-il, as being his successor. Same thing, cult of personality, the great leader, he was called. He continued until 2011. When he died, he named his youngest son, Kim Jong-un, as the leader. Now, despite the fact that the Soviet Union had really bolstered them early on, the repression of that regime proved to be very unproductive. They're extremely um, repressive, they tightly control people's lives, they really suppress initiative, religion has been outlawed officially, it is the last Stalinist regime uh, on the planet, and despite all the help they got early on from the USSR, um, the economy stagnated in the 70s. Through the 80s and 90s, they suffered from severe famine. There were floods and droughts and typhoons. Malnutrition in North Korea is widespread, despite the fact that the official story of the government is that we are the paradise on earth and that we have to be very protective of ourselves because everybody else wants to invade because we got it so much better than everyone else, which is the official party line in North Korea, as it used to be in Albania, for instance, under Inver Hossa. Um, the brutal suppression, terrible hardship for the people, um, and while South Korea has grown to 50 million people, North Korea has 25 million, only half as many, even though they started out uh, comparable. Brief history, brief, brief history of Korea. I'll get into the Korean conflict tomorrow night with more detail about that and how that all unfolded. Any questions about this topic, history of Korea? Just absolutely stunned you. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. You said that the Koreans had developed uh, 
bronze, for example, mm -hmm. uh, in times BC, did they develop that independently of China? Or do you think it was seeded over? In other words, as you look at the waves of innovation and civilization occurring on the Korean Peninsula, did they follow uh, what was happening in China? Right. So the question is, the early uh, advent of bronze, and then which is like 1000 BC, and then later the uh, iron, 300 BC or so in Korea, did they develop that um, on their own, or was that an influence that they received from China? Almost certainly they received initially from China, because as early as the Shang um, uh, Empire, or the Shang Dynasty in um, China, we know they had very sophisticated bronze metallurgy. I mean, they're doing these 900 pound cast bells, and uh, that was in BC as well. And so certainly at least the seeds of that would have come over from China. I don't think there's any question, because a lot of the things, even though Korea in their pride as a nation and their, you know, their sense of history, they are very independent. They still, because of proximity and because China has, you know, a much longer, more developed in ancient history kind of culture, there's no question that a lot of things have come over. I mean, religion, religious ideas, and also a lot of the technology, but then they put their own brand on it. Um, and in many ways develop more sophisticated um, development of metallurgy and things like that in um, Korea than they had in other places. Like I say, ceramics, for instance. The Japanese ceramics, which are, you know, everybody knows how spectacular they are. The Japanese will admit, most of them, that it was Korean potters, Korean ceramicists, that actually taught them how to do what they're able to do now. So, any other questions? Yes? What was the influence of the movies in South Korea? I'm sorry, what's that? The movies in the 70s. The, oh, the movies. The movies. Oh, the movies in the 70s, the Universalist Church. Um, well, the people that they influenced, they influenced a lot, but they were not a major force. Um, this is, if you know about the Moonies or the Universalist Church, uh, it was the Reverend Sun Young Moon. He created a religion, a pseudo-Christian kind of religion. They particularly were noted for uh, mass weddings. It's like they would get thousands of men and women, introduce them to one another, and then marry them that day. Uh, they had never met the people they were supposed to marry because this was a decision made by Sun Young Moon. Um, I don't think that he had any significant influence culturally. I think that he was seen as being a cult uh, in Korea by most people the same way we would see that, you know, looking at it from outside. There were just too many unorthodox approaches to that. And the idea that he, he professed to have absolute power and absolute wisdom and, you know, you sort of see all of that sort of thing repeating in, in so, shall we say, offshoot religions. Um, yes? We understand that President Moon is in favor of rapprochement, discussions, and talks with him. Um, but we also heard that uh, a number of the old refugees from the north were still in South Korea. Right. Or to London, as are some of the old refugees in Miami. Right, exactly. Right. So the question is that, you know, there are the current administration that's been installed since the, you know, the arrest of the, um, the first and as of now last female president. Um, there has been a movement toward the current South Korean government of wanting to have conversations with the North. You will have noticed that at the recent Olympic Games, the North Korean athletes marched together with the South Korean athletes. Nothing like that has ever happened. And so they're, they are making efforts to try to, you know, to communicate. And you're right, there's an absolute split in the same way there was with, and it's a, the perfect example is that Cuban refugees in Miami, most of them were absolutely against the United States giving any recognition to Cuba or anything else. You know, they, they refused that. Well, there are many people in South Korea who suffered under the North Korean regime, or at least experience what the North Korean regime is capable of, and they are very much against South Korea doing anything to initiate contact, rapprochement with the, the North Koreans, uh, believing that that's just not possible, and it's only inviting a, some sort of either compromise or of a betrayal on the part of the North, because they don't believe they're capable of 
fair and legitimate negotiation anymore. But there are others who are saying we cannot continue to be at the brink of war constantly. Since then, and I'll talk about this a little bit tomorrow night, it's not just that the war ended in 1953. There have been flare-ups and incidents. Uh, North Korea has tried four times to dig tunnels under the DMZ in order to try to invade in that way. There have been, you know, there are shootings that happen and not infrequently. Uh, and so many of the people in South Korea are saying something has to happen to stop this. There are currently more missiles and uh, artillery shells aimed at Seoul, Korea than any place else on the planet ever. You know, the North Koreans have said that if anything starts, Seoul is going to be gone. Um, and of course, all of the testing of, of missiles and the idea of developing nuclear capabilities and everything else in the North, many people are saying whatever, whatever chance we have to take, we have to try to do something. Um, I agree that it cannot continue the way it is without something horrific happening. And that then would draw in other powers as well. Although there are not a whole lot of powers that are standing on the side of North Korea, it would, you know, it would force confrontations between other parties just if they went, went to war. So uh, my own sense is that North Korea cannot continue as it is. Uh, it, it, the fact that it's lasted as long as it has with its people starving and repressed as badly as they are, um, I think I think at some point, hopefully in the near future, something has to cave in there, and there will be an opportunity to put something else in its place. But yeah, something needs to happen because North and South Korea are at the brink of war every day, still. I, beyond that, I cannot get any any sort of prophetic vision for what's going to happen. But that's my own sense of it, and I can understand the people who say, "Well, we don't trust them either, but we need to do something." Thank you all very much.